So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Matthew Shapiro. He is a professor of political science in the Department of Social Sciences at the Illinois Institute of Technology. He's also a research affiliate at Argonne National Laboratories Joint Center for Energy Storage Research and has held research fellowships and appointments at the Asiatic Research Institute at Korea University, the East Asia Institute, the Industrial Technology Research Institute, and the Electronics and Telecommunications Research Institute. Shapiro's published and ongoing research lies at the intersection between environmental and energy policies, economics, and public policy. Shapiro's work has been published in numerous academic journals. Welcome, Dr. Shapiro. Thanks. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here, and thanks for the introduction. Um, well, it uh, seems like it's just an, a very exciting conference uh, and summer school to be a part of, and uh, I'm, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, when I was designing this talk, I uh, was faced with um, you know, some questions about what would be the most appropriate way to cover the information. Should I go through my own research, which spans quite a bit of content uh, relating to climate change related communications? Should I talk about you know, on, uh, ongoing research or, or prospective research and, and present some findings? And then I realized um, it's probably best if I just try and synthesize some of the core ideas that I use as the foundation for my own research. And not coincidentally, uh, some of those people that I use as the foundation are actually uh, on the list of speakers for this summer school. So good for you. And I hope there isn't a lot of redundancy between what I am talking about and what you are uh, going to hear in other, in other uh, talks. But um, the overarching questions that I want to focus on are uh, as follows. Uh, first, how can we model and analyze the climate change, uh, climate science rather, politics communication process? How does politics further confound the existing challenges faced by climate science and the scientists when speaking to those outside of their respective domains? And then how do the media play a role in terms of impacting public opinion and policy outcomes? We are going to talk about public opinion and then what options are there to improve how climate science is communicated to the general public? Uh, and, and I have to say, I, um, I jump around a bit here. It's, it's very difficult to be linear because a lot of the effects uh, go one direction and, and then they come back the other from the media to the public, from the public to the politicians. Uh, and then um, from politicians back to the media or, or something like that. And I'm not going to sketch out any sort of grand scheme uh, today, but um, hopefully you'll be putting those pieces together in your mind as you uh, go through this after we wrap up, I should say. The main tasks for us are to, first of all, talk about the policymaking. And I cover in my own um uh, classes when I'm teaching on these subjects, a lot of uh, public policy creation, uh, how, how to analyze policy, and uh, some of that will filter into what we're going to be talking about today. We're also going to acknowledge some of the key aspects of how things actually make it onto the policy agenda, which is uh, this um, uh, measure of salience, conflict, and also the role of public opinion we're going to also justify inelegant policy models, which means basically that we can't ignore politics. And this is um, going to rely heavily on some very basic ideas presented by Deborah Stone in her book, The, the Policy Paradox. But it, again, is a core theme in the, uh, in, the, in the research that I'm going to be covering here. A lot of what this presentation will be is essentially a, a, a grand literature review. And then we'll consider arguments about uh, government intervention with regard to climate change related policies. And then we'll under, I'm sorry, we'll examine public opinion and uh, then talk about how we can actually bridge the science and policymaking gap, which will focus especially on climate change, but, and, and climate science. But, you know, there are some digressions I think that are worth pointing out. 
like maybe, you know, as it relates to GMOs, genetically modified organisms, or even more recently, the uh, vaccine debate here in the United States. I know that this is an international audience, but a lot of the focus will be on um, institutions and norms and beliefs here in the U.S. simply because that's the probably the, the, the biggest paradox. Uh, we, we generate the, a huge amount of emissions here in the United States, and we have some very proactive uh, scientists that are focusing on climate change, yet we have a very under-mobilized and under-motivated um, a set of politicians and the general public is still pretty on the fence about what to do with regard to climate change. We're, we're very divided on this issue. Uh, that doesn't mean that I won't, um, I, I, I can't speculate about how this might play out in other, in other countries and I'd be willing to talk about that if you have any questions. Who has a voice in the policymaking process? Whose voice can be threatened. And I like to look at um, James Hansen as an example here because uh, of what he has done over time with regard to drawing attention to climate change, to climate science. Uh, as a NASA researcher, he has been duty bound to understand and protect our home planet. Um, of course, um, there has been some uh, modification of this to focus on uh, the, uh, the, the future in space exploration, scientific discovery and aeronautics research. Um, but I encourage you to uh, click on these videos where uh, I believe these are all from, I believe these are all from uh, Democracy Now! Amy Goodman's show um, where she is actually trying to parse out exactly what happened when Hansen uh, uh, decided that he would speak out against some of the governmental policies or the, the lack of initiative at NASA as it is under the executive branch uh, for making any sort of any sort of attempt to address climate change uh, or highlight the, the science of climate change. Everything was sort of dismissed and this didn't sit well with him. Of course, he was then attacked and has been played um, uh, quite a defensive role um, because, be, 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 simply because of this. Things are now changing. It, it, it really is a, a function of who is in the White House. But um, I only introduced this because it's a, a juicy tidbit, but we have to really think about where Hansen's statements and others, you know, whether it's against the science of climate change, which is what we will talk about later, um, or if it's you know for more proactive um, uh, policies that will address climate change, how can we understand the role of all of this? And um, to do this, we have to turn to the policy cycle, which is just a, a very simple and straightforward process to explain how policies are created. And I, I don't think this is any different uh, in, in any sort of liberal democracy where there is a deliberative process involving how policies are created. Typically, we start here at the problem definition or agenda setting uh, uh, point. And then after something makes it onto the agenda, which is actually no small feat to make it onto the agenda, there are a host of hurdles. You have to have sufficient consensus and support um, and uh, and an evidence that there is actually a problem. So framing the problem is is a big deal, and how that um, problem is is uh, is is shared with the general public through the media, typically by by politicians through the media, uh, is or or through Twitter now because of these new um, ways of of communicating directly through social media. Um, once it's on the agenda, though, it, it becomes a process of uh, how to actually formulate the policy, legitimate the policy, and then finally, if it makes it that far, implement it. And after it has gone through a cycle, through through a, a certain after a certain time period has passed, imp evaluating whether that policy actually holds up, and then determining whether policy change is needed. But again, getting onto the agenda is, uh, is the issue. 
And for this, I'm just gonna, I wonder, no, I was gonna bring up the, the chat. I don't know where my chat is. There it is. It should be at the bottom of the oh, screen. Yeah, I got it. Um, okay. So uh, there are two core features. One is the issue salience and one is the level of conflict. And by conflict, I mean conflict among politicians, but that doesn't um, necessarily disconnect it from whether there's conflict among the general public. Um, so if there is high conflict, uh, versus low conflict. And if there is high salience, whether it's uh, something that's viewed as being important, sufficiently important, or low, low salience. And again, this is a very crude two by two dimension, but uh, this can actually play a big role um, to, to, ex uh, to, to expect what in fact will result uh, with, whether it's something will make it onto the agenda. Let me, let me just say that. And so here in the United States, we see, for example, certain issues having high salience and high conflict like crime and gun control. We, we, we simply don't know how to address crime. Uh, and uh, uh, but it, so, so some people say, uh, you know, we need more police and some people say we need um, different approaches taken by the police. And this is a very divisive issue, which makes it a high conflict issue. Yet everyone is concerned generally about, about crime. Um, everyone's also concerned about airline safety, but no one is divided over how to address it. Just get us there safely. Um, and then on the other hand, we have low salience issues like abortion rights, which people aren't really prioritizing as an issue. Um, of course, it makes it into the news, but it's a very high conflict issue. Very, very divisive. You see the um, images of um, face to, uh, pro pro choice and pro life protesters uh, facing off with each other. Some issues are low conflict and low salience. We just simply don't seem to follow what's going on with these pork barrel projects, where uh, members of Congress are adding on their own preferences and, and lines to these omnibus bills, where they can bring home the pork, as we say, to their home districts. Well. What do you think would be a, a um, you know, a, 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 a low, I'm sorry, uh, what would have the best chance of making it onto the agenda among these different four options? Something that's in the top left, top right, lower left, or lower right quadrants here. I don't think I'm going to do a poll, so let me just give it to you. The one in the bottom left, high salience, low conflict, has the best chance um, the one in the top right, low salience yet high conflict is actually the, going to have the worst chance, which, which is why we actually don't see a lot of discussion about abortion rights. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's mentioned, it's alluded to, but no one is going out with a megaphone, as a politician at least. Most, most uh, politicians uh, don't go out there and... Um, and, and uh, put themselves at high political risk because of the high conflict nature of, of, of abortion rights. But the real question for us is where does si uh, climate change fit in all of this? Where can we actually plug climate change? Is it a high salience issue? Is it a high conflict issue? Low conflict, high salience, et cetera. And um, the first thing we have to do is figure out whether in fact it is of sufficient salience. And to do this, I went to the Pew data. Uh, this is somewhat dated, but it's the latest I could find. Uh, so it's from 2017. Um, it, the, the patterns are quite similar. And Pew, if you're not familiar with them, is a very reliable um, uh, source of, of surveys of the American public, representative samples of the American public. Here we are, climate change, 38% rate climate change is a top priority for Trump and Congress in 2017. This is for the entire public. Now, of course, if you divided that up by Democrats and Republicans, um, as well as uh, education level and income, there, there would be some variance here. In fact, we can do that now if we break it down by, um, by age. 
So here, if we're looking at uh, 18 to 29 year olds, 30 to 49 year olds, 50 to 64 year olds and seniors 65 plus, we can see that the percentage rating climate change as a top priority for Trump and Congress, uh, it, it's actually 48% for 18 to 29 year olds and it drops to 34% for seniors. That's a, uh, in terms of the difference to 14% gap between the two. Um, and I, I mean, there are some other issues where that we see some sort of variance, but this is among the highest, at least in terms of youth being more preferential towards it. Um, and then we have at the top, the it's ordered by where seniors rank it higher than, than youth. We see that the military and addressing lobbyist interests and, and I'm sorry, influence and then transportation related focus. Um, those are, are more important for, uh, for elderly, for the elderly population. So in the environment and climate change are clearly a preference for the younger population. And then in terms of comparing uh, climate change over time, uh, the percentage rating each a top priority for president and Congress in each year. Uh, in uh, January 2009, which was Obama's first year, it was about 30% that viewed climate change as a priority. It actually rose to 38% in the uh, just after um, uh, Trump was elected. Um, so, in spite of there being a, uh, in spite of Americans being um, uh, exposed to a, a much more conservative president in 2016 and with all the campaigning, uh, focusing on immigration and terrorism. I see the comment by Konstantinos, yes, uh, Americans do freak out about terrorism and that's usually connected with uh, defense policy and immigration. Um, which, which was the campaign pledge that Trump ran on, even in spite of all of that narrative that was pushed, still 38%. Um, uh, there, there was an 8% eight, eight increase from when Obama took office to when Trump took office. So there is a, a natural progression to view climate change as being a more important issue. Does that mean it's sufficiently salient? Well, again, not as much as some of these other issues that we see here. I wanna also point out that a key feature of policymaking is, and again, this is most likely true for all liberal democracies or, or those that tend towards liberal democratic principles, there is this tendency towards incrementalism. Um, incrementalism in how policies are designed. This is because of time constraints for the, the politicians, namely, they are focusing on the next uh, election, whether it's a two-year cycle or a six-year cycle or a four-year cycle. And this is true at all levels of government, you should note. Um, there are also financial constraints. It simply is difficult to do everything that one might hope with regard to climate change, to uh, implement uh, all of the necessary um, wind farms and solar panels. Uh, New York Times has an article out today that uh, describes what needs to happen by 2050, showing uh, in the United States the where we are today with wind farms and solar um, solar farms, solar installations, and where we have to be. And uh, there's clearly uh, uh, we're we're very far from from that target right now. To reach that target, though, can't happen all at once. We simply can't afford it. It would bankrupt the country. We would. Uh, we, we we don't have the resources too. It's not just financial constraints. It's also logistics. We can't implement all of these solar panels that we need. They have to be built. They have to be installed. We don't have the labor. People aren't trained, etc. Um, as well as the fact that financial constraints make it difficult to actually understand and the time constraints to actually test for whether a specific policy is uh, feasible, whether um, policy X to deal with climate change is the uh, most ideal policy, because if we're going to fully assess it from the scientific perspective, it takes considerable amount of time. And uh, most scientists are actually unwilling to go forward and say, yes, go with this policy without having done a sufficient 
um, gone through a sufficient scientific process to to vet all of these policy um, policy alternatives. And this is actually a gap that exists between how science is done and how policy analysis is done. And, and that gap is one that we will be talking about today too. And then finally, we simply don't have agreement on goals when we have low salience, high conflict, or straight, straight up high conflict, high salience issues. Those simply won't make it um, in onto the agenda. So that's agenda setting. And, and that's important because of communications. Communications are going to actually play a big role in how we as, as members of the public and how uh, elected officials are responding to what is happening uh, in the discourse that's out there, whether it's from the media or whether it's from uh, the executive branch, Trump saying one thing, Biden saying one thing, it doesn't matter. Uh, that, that bully pulpit is extremely influential and, and, and can play a big role. So where does the science come in? That's what we'll be talking about. I also want to um, highlight th uh, that Deborah Stone concept of the policy paradox, how we have to recognize politics, how we can't ignore the fact that there are some things that simply can't be explained with regard to policy outcomes. We need climate change, but we aren't willing to go forward with it. Uh, we, we need, um, uh, for, for example, yeah, let me just read the slide. Losing is winning, for example. The idea that um, a, a vote, uh, a, a failed, a guaranteed failed vote can actually be, um, uh, uh, can actually play a big role, um, even though it's guaranteed to fail, well, what that does is it sends out a signal. If people are on the record voting yes or no for a particular issue, that yes or no vote can be documented later on. There is much more at stake when those votes are, are called and, and, and when they're cast because of the fact that it is um, uh, on the record. And this um, means that a failed, a guaranteed failed vote for something like Trump's impeachment, you know, which happened, um, that was in, in February, I believe the, the vote was cast. It was guaranteed to fail. And, and yet uh, the second impeachment um, still went, went forward. Um, Neo-Nazis parade, neo-Nazi parades, for example, being protected under the first amendment, something that uh, is not just uh, a seemingly a policy failure, but it's something that can't be ignored without looking at our institutions, our political institutions and our rules and our norms. That's what I mean when I say political institutions. The way, again, that things are framed, when we say welfare policies in the United States, that has a much more negative connotation, especially from uh, the, the conservatives here, it, it it reflects um, uh, free writing, but you know that's the the long and the short of it. It reflects free writing, uh, but but ultimately, welfare policies are po uh, policies that are focusing on public spending for poor, hungry children. That is, in fact, what welfare policies do, and those welfare policies being framed as welfare versus poor, hungry children. The dis the distinction between those can actually um, uh, get around some of the um, uh, the negative stigma that's associated with welfare welfare in, in in quotes just simply saying welfare. This also means that we have very inelegant modeling of how policies are created uh, and and implemented. Things have to be examined at the community level. We can't just rely on a market based policy process. Market based meaning cost-benefit analysis. You look at how much something costs, you look at how much you can, whether you're in the red or the black after the analysis is done. And then let's just say you have a, a few different policies in place. Um, policy uh, one is you uh, install um, uh, uh, you know, 500 new solar installations for, for energy generation. Uh, and policy two is you install um, uh, 500 new uh, wind installations. And just looking at those two policies and looking at the cost benefit analysis, you decide, well, solar is the way to go. It's not that simple, simply because we have to account for 
some of the, the um, geographic differences. We have to talk about, in the United States at least, the federalist system, which means that there might be pushback from some of the local governments. Uh, there are also going to be um, concerns about all of that money going to the wind gener I said wind, didn't I? Well, let's just say I said solar. I think I did. All that money going to the Southwest, which is where solar generally is being built. And uh, the, the wind farms are uh, more um, focused in the, the Midwest and in the, the Northeast, especially. Um, so you, if the money is all going to go to the Southwest in California, that means that there would be some uh, big debates going on from the representatives from those states and the states that weren't getting all of that funding. This is where we talk about these community-based uh, approaches, the, addressing the politics, um, trying to also understand what we mean when we say something like climate change, or the big one that I think is still very misunderstood is sustainability. Maybe you've heard this term mentioned during the summer school program. What do we mean when we say sustainability? How do we frame it? Is it just about the environment or, or uh, increasingly it has quite a bit more to do with re redistribution of, um, of income, which is uh, something that seems inherently connected to the environment in my view. It also has to address power and cooperation, which is an inherent political construct and this idea of ideas that are um, manifesting in terms of a pro-public policy and an anti-big government division. We're gonna actually talk more about that. Um, I, I wanna highlight a couple more survey results before I do though. Um, the percentage of adults who say that uh, the expanded production of oil, coal, natural gas should be more important than uh, alternative sources such as wind and solar. Uh, we see a division here, again, the youth primarily focusing on wind and solar uh, 65 plus, still the majority focusing on wind and solar, but there is a uh, significant um, em emphasis, greater emphasis on oil, coal, and natural gas relative to the younger population. That's the age difference again. Let's talk about the partisan differences. In terms of the percentage of adults who say it's possible or not possible to cut back on environmental regulations and still uh, efficient, I'm sorry, effectively protect air and water quality in the US, uh, when you look at all adults, it's pretty evenly divided. Most Republicans, though, are saying that it's possible to cut back on environmental regulations and still protect air and water quality. And then we see it go the other direction for Democrats and those leaning Democrat. And then finally, Americans, uh, in terms of the percentage of adults who say that the following would, uh, that, the, that the private marketplace will ensure, uh, that, that the private marketplace will ensure effective ways to increase reliance on renewable energy versus the government regulations that can increase reliance on renewable energy. Things are not too out of balance. 54% uh, say government regulations are needed, 38% say the private marketplace will do it. And this question is the one that I want to look at a little bit more um, using one of the um, chapters from Silva Kul et al's book, Global Energy Policy, um, mainly because a lot of those energy policies that we're focusing on these days have quite a bit to do with the climate change uh, reflective policies. If we let the government, I'm sorry, if we let the market decide, um, the, the, the arguments in support of that are that it will allow for the optimal allocation of resources for social utility. This is what every economist will say is actually, it actually justifies economists, period. Um, they are the ones that are measuring social util, uh, utility and, and allocation of resources. Um, and then uh, that externalities can be internalized into prices. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with externalities, we're talking especially about some of the negative outcomes. It's not always a negative ex externality. It could be a positive externality. But what we mean are things like, what we're referencing here are things like the, uh, the, the pollution that's being generated 
those the free market ters are arguing can be internalized into prices and then those pri those price uh, changes would probably be passed on to the consumer if we're thinking about energy uh, costs for example and uh, free marketers are also arguing that picking winners would limit options that it's going to keep um, uh, uh, it's going to possibly uh, exhaust resources or um, make it difficult to explore or develop other options besides that single that single target that the government would otherwise that the government would otherwise be targeting. Um, and then also they say that uh, market tools are successful for environmental programs. Uh, I'm sorry, problems like the cap and trade uh, setup that was uh, generated, um, uh, not cap and trade, it was the, basically the, 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 the cap program through the acid rain program in the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments. That these market tools are actually um, the things like cap and trade and things like emissions permits can actually help establish the optimal level of pollution by setting a fixed number of pollution li uh, licenses or allowances. And, and there is evidence from uh, the EU, for example, that uh, that m does hold, hold water, but at the national level, nothing has yet been done. There are efforts at the, uh, the, the regional level in the Northeast in the United States, as well as in California, but things still haven't taken hold at the national level. The other argument is that the government should decide. Um, and, and the argument here uh, uh, is that the, the markets are rigged, that, um, uh, that uh, uh, we, we simply can't uh, get around the fact that transaction costs are high, that consumers um, are, uh, are, are, are not necessarily rational, that competition isn't necessarily balanced. Um, the, 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 that there are these externalities, all of these things make a strong argument that the markets don't work on their own. And, and it's actually a very, very uh, solid argument, I, I would say, maybe among any of these. Economists also fail to assign values for externalities without political inf uh, interference and without uh, problematic value judgments. And, and this is not their fault. Uh, it's just simply very, very difficult to assign an objective value for something that is necessarily subjective. And uh, again, we're going to talk more about some of these uh, values uh, that, are, that are assigned later on. Um, there's also the argument that wealthy stakeholders are gaming the market instruments to preserve the status quo and that any sort of successful energy transition is a function of strong government intervention. But um, um, yeah, this is, this is actually uh, the, 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 these are the two arguments and they reflect what I was presenting uh, at the bottom of the previous slide. And it, it's an important uh, point because ultimately policies are about challenging whether things should be left alone or not. And when we think of climate change and all of the policies that are connected to climate change, like energy related policies, it's to say that there is a problem that the market doesn't fix on its own, that the government needs to step in because of the lack of competition, because of these uh, externalities, because of some sort of information asymmetries, because the technology is simply locked in and uh, the, we, we, we can't get away in the case of um, things like fossil fuels, we can't get away from it because we are so reliant on it. And uh, there is this infrastructure that we're not willing to break to move towards some sort of new technology. But I wanna shift now to a, a key player in the policymaking process, which is a, a key player, a key, um, a, a key, a, a key key feature of the policymaking process, which is public opinion. And uh, to do this, I'm going to focus on the Ansel Oberon Kaniski book, Cheap and Clean, which if you haven't looked at this, it's a, it's a great survey about what we need to consider with regard to the public's view towards climate change related policymaking. Mainly, um, 
the fact that coal and oil are superior to solar and wind in terms of economics, they simply cost less. Um, and uh, that if we think about the social benefits of solar and wind versus the economic costs, the social benefits meaning uh, uh, the, the cleaner air, the, um, the, the, the climate change related um, effects, those just offset the, the costs that are related to it. And of course, uh, health benefits can be divided into economic costs and benefits as well as social benefits. Social benefits, uh, again, are more along the lines of environmental benefits, cleaner air, uh, uh, disconnected from, from those health costs. Keep in mind um, that uh, we have this very, very low priority to deal with climate change. And um, we uh, have to understand the complex value systems of the American public at any point in time. But um, this really isn't uh, the case for uh, Ansel Baron Kaniski. What they are saying is that uh, Americans' public energy preferences are, can be boiled down into economic costs and environmental harms. Is it expensive? Will I get sick? And while um, people like alternative fuels and think they're cheaper and cleaner than traditional fuels, they're actually still slightly more expensive um, in the end. And to show this definitively, what Ansel uh, and Kaniski do is they gauge the weight people place on economic considerations, on environmental considerations, and on other factors in choosing what energy sources are um, feasible in the United States for the future. And in terms of uh, what they found, um, it, uh, the harms and costs are important to understand people's selection of an energy source. Harms and costs explain 75% of variation in support for fuels. Harms have a greater weight than costs, uh, th these environmental harms. And, and health related harms. And uh, these harms, when we weight them across fuels, whether it's coal, solar, nuclear, and, and look at the harms and, um, and uh, costs across these different, um, the, these uh, environmental and, and health harms versus the economic costs, I, I hope that's clear. Um, when we look at them across these different energy sources, we're actually going to see the same sort of weight waiting scheme for, for all of them. But still, that doesn't help us understand why we have a bias towards solar and wind. And they, Ansel Blair and Kaniski say, well, it's simply because people have the wrong prices. Uh, people think that these fuels are cheap and that factors other than costs are impeding the introduction of solar and wind. People also elevate uh, these fuels relative to coal and oil in terms of the pollution related outcomes. So there's a greater weight being given to the environment than to the economy. Um, and uh, we actually then have to recognize that this would be inconsistent with what the public's policy priorities have been in the past. This, uh, the, 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 the economy is, is actually um, number two. It's actually always at the top. Uh, because the economy means jobs, it means uh, economic development and progress. Most importantly, and then to connect this back with Deborah Stone, these subjective views are not included in any sort of formal policy assessment. They are um, excluded. And, and this is where we have to, um, again, reiterate the importance of the, the political features, these political features about public opinion. How do we bring them in? How do we make policymaking um, necessarily efficient and effective and representative of what in fact is happening in a particular geography? Uh, and to do that, we have to recognize these kinds of complex understandings, seemingly counterintuitive. Uh, there's another study that came out recently that sort of provides a little more uh, evidence of this. Um, yeah, it, it basically says that when, if we were going to have a carbon tax, who supports it and who supports what we do 
with the revenue that we generate from a carbon tax. Many, many people in the United States would support the development of clean energy. Uh, and then there are these other issues uh, that represent uh, America's infrastructure. Remember, this was a big issue for the elderly population, transportation, um, and among other things, um, including assisting workers in the coal industry that might lose their jobs as a result of the tax. That said, um, this is, uh, a, there are some key differences. If we're going to compare uh, Republicans to Democrats, we're going to see that they would support the proposed carbon tax significantly less. And uh, for those that are um, not believers in global warming, they would also support the carbon tax significantly less to relative to those that don't know whether global warming is happening. And while those that do believe global warming is happening would support it significantly more relative to those that don't know. So again, the, um, the, the partisan divide and the knowledge and belief about climate change is an important feature here. Okay, that's where I want to stop with regard to public opinion. I wanna talk now about the science and try and connect policymaking with science itself. And first, I just want to say science and scientific methods, those concepts are not completely lacking when we think of policymaking. Judges, for example, weigh scientific evidence on climate change. Um, that um, also means that th they need to properly, properly operationalize key terms when they're making their assessments. They need to define just like scientists do, what it means when they say effective or damage or standard. And without those clear definitions and measurements, or at least without the definition that can be measured, the measurement is typically done in the scientific community. The, the actual um, understanding of what a term means is used by everyone, both in law and in the, the scientific community. Without proper oper operationalization of those key terms, uh, no ruling can be made. Science is also connected to politics. Why? Because scientists are actually moving increasingly more into the political atmosphere. There's also a boundary between scientific evidence and um, opinion that has to be addressed. How that will be addressed is actually something that we'll get to when we bring up the Keller reading. And then finally, there are these policy pressures that are very different from the scientific method. Uh, I know I mentioned earlier that there are, you know, incrementalism is connect, you know, the, the idea of incrementalism and in policymaking is somewhat connected to incrementalism in the scientific method, but really climate change related science is um, very, is operating on a very, very different um, time horizon than how policies are designed. Politician focuses on now Scientists are oriented toward the future. Roger Revell said, the scientist is oriented toward the future. The politician's orientation is usually here and now. Infinity is the election after the next one for the politician. Uh, that was Roger Revell. So the politician responds immediately, addresses things immediately, and the, the scientist is providing information that cannot uh, occur on demand. It sort of trickles out as necessary. And, um, you know, I, I think it's also worth highlighting some of this kind of phenomena when we look at how the science related to the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic has, has, um, has, uh, has taken place, how it has been politicized, how some of the rhetoric that have been used to address that has, um, has uh, created some serious divisions, not unlike the same divisions that exist around climate change. So the bottom line is that this is about how policymakers are crafting policies using information based on experts and the public. If priorities differ between the public and experts, what are the policymakers going to do? Can they be moved towards the wrong policies because of public opinion? Sure. And what happens if decisions are made under the auspices of science, like, um, like, like this, 
in Minnesota, there were these frogs that were having these health problems and everyone, uh, the scientific community decided that it would be best to provide everyone with uh, bottled water just to keep themselves possibly safe because they didn't know one way or the other. And what ended up happening was they, they ultimately discovered that this frog related uh, sickness wasn't a sickness at all. It was actually part of the actual natural development of the frog and um, how they missed that. It, it was something very obscure, but that translated later into some uh, skepticism about what the scientists could do, what they were capable of doing. And it um, of course means that those individuals that were exposed to this uh, experience were um, uh, uh, unable to uh, recognize the scientific method itself, that, that uh, science is inherently a process of revision, of re refutation, of challenge, and uh, nothing, is, uh, nothing is certain. Um, so, uh, so, so something that we have to uh, keep in mind. And uh, finally, um, science is relying on experimentation and empiricism. Public officials, on the other hand, are focusing on how to calculate a standard's correctness using other kinds of criteria. One, will it satisfy enough public and private interests to be enforceable? Two, can it be enforced with existing governmental personnel and within the budget? And three, does the standard appear credible? Is it something that is going to hold water, um, that will hold water by the general public? This credibility is actually an important segue into that Ann Keller study that um, I recently used as the theoretical basis for um, a project that I did on battery, uh, next generation battery technology research. Let me introduce what she is pointing out with regard to scientists. She's, she's focusing on how scientists can communicate to politicians. I just want to clarify, I'm done at 12, I'm sorry, at, uh, I have about 20 minutes left, is that right? Um, yes, we're done at 12.35. Okay, so uh, 25 minutes, okay, thanks. Um, so the, uh, the, what Ann Keller is presenting is uh, two things that scientists can actually exercise credibility, which is to communicate scientifically neutral research facts, as well as relevance, which is to present results that speak to policymakers' concerns. Relevance is very much in line with that idea of salience that I talked about earlier. She points out that the current research shows that the distance from politics can actually preserve a scientific assessment's credibility that uh, the, 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 the farther removed a scientific assessment is from politics, the more credible that assessment can be. Scientists, scientists though, can also be used as pawns, which is where we see a lot of how the um, scientific community has been manipulated in terms of climate change related communications in the United States, especially in the United States where the um, scientific debate about climate change has been pretty balanced. I'm sure you've been exposed to this already. Uh, you, the, the idea that there is this actual, um, some scientists agree with climate change, some agree that it's not, uh, uh, that the science is unresolved, um, that this debate has been, uh, has been manufactured uh, as uh, being somewhat balanced, but it's a false equivalence because as I'm sure you've already heard, there are the, the majority, the consensus, 95% or 90% or whatever it is, say at the very least that 90% uh, say that it's uh, climate change is real and it's anthropogenic. The way that scientists can be used as pawns is if one politician br brings in one scientist to support his or her arguments, while another politician brings in another scientist to say something completely different, which is again, going back to how climate change has been presented or had been presented. We don't see so much of that these days because it seems as though the climate change debate has sort of uh, been accepted. It takes enough extreme weather events and floods and hurricanes to, to finally wake up some of the uh, skeptics. But, but it's, it's definitely not 
totally swallowed yet by the American public. And, and, um, and we, we can re return to this uh, point when I present a few different things later. How do, how do scientists do this? Um, they actually can buffer their work from bias and politicization. They can also link with politicians that might rely on their science output. This is a very, very, uh, very, very important distinction. And uh, organizations, her hypotheses are that organizations seeking to protect their scientific credibility are going to pursue buffering strategies. Organizations seeking to enhance their political reference, uh, I'm sorry, relevance will pursue linking strategies. And uh, by looking at how this played out over the National Research Council, the, um, the, uh, the, the uh, National Acid Precipitation Assessment Program and the IPCC, it showed that there were um, instances of where both buffering and linking are occurring together, uh, that the effects on relevance or credibility aren't necessarily perfectly clear and that some strategies are hard to characterize as one or the other. I did the same sort of study uh, or I employed the same sort of logic to my research on Jay Caesar at Argonne where I'm a research affiliate trying to see how they actually framed the research about science, uh, the science of next generation battery uh, research and development because I um, expected there to be some connection between what next generation battery research would allow to occur with regard to uh, the climate change related debate and I'm sorry, the climate change related uh, problems. And what I found was that there was virtually no mention by JC scientists in their scientific findings or in the announcements that were put into the, um, into the, uh, into the media. Uh, uh, nothing was framed in terms of climate change. Most of the arguments were framed in terms of the, the cost that could be reduced the uh, efficiencies that would res result if we had more um, uh, effective batteries. Um, the uh, air pollution was alluded to, uh, the air pollution was alluded to, but um, not so much with regard to greenhouse gas emissions as it was with regard to things like carbon monoxide. So uh, a great example of how the, how the, uh, the J. Caesar case um, supports uh, buffering and linking, um, where uh, they're avoiding the, the political tensions, but trying to make their technology much more salient. And if you're not aware of Jay Caesar's um, support mechanism, re funding support mechanisms through the Department of Energy, which is going to all be approved through the standard governmental processes, meaning that the politi politicians are want, going to want to know what, in fact, uh, what in fact, uh, they're going to want to see what in fact J. Caesar is claiming they can do with their technology. And some of those climate change skeptics would maybe push back against the continued funding if that was for the purposes of mitigating climate change related effects. That's to the politicians. What about to the general public? And uh, yeah, this is funny, but it's not necessarily this poor guy's fault uh, because this is what we see when it comes to some of the scientific findings. When we look at what it, some of the research shows about the um, relative risk of cancer, you may have seen this. I think John Oliver presented something about this um, maybe a year or two ago about how we have this variance across some of the scientific findings. Uh, what is, what create, I'm sorry, what, what prevents cancer that's on the left side and what uh, causes cancer? Wine. What prevents and causes cancer? Tomatoes, tea, milk, all the way down. Beef is primarily causing cancer, but still there is, there are certain, there's a, a research finding that shows that it actually can um, prevent cancer. Now I know it's a, a very, very topical uh, presentation. We don't, we're not talking about controls and all of that, or you know how much beef, how much wine, etc. But uh, the 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 disconnect that we are exposed to as members of the public between a, a, a clear scientific message versus all of these mixed messages is something that 
uh, can actually translate into the, the climate change science itself. And this is uh, Karen Akerlof's work. I believe she's talking to you tomorrow and I uh, maybe I'll, I hope I'm not giving away her punchline, but it's a great study that she did that looks at the um, nature of climate change related reporting in the media, looking at especially how climate models, the models of the climate have appeared in the US newspapers. Um, and, and what they show in their research is that climate models, the use of climate models in the media has declined over time simply because of perhaps the lack of understanding that journalists have about how to interpret these climate models. Again, it's science, it's atmospheric science. It's very difficult to understand and follow lots of moving parts uh, a huge, I mean, some supercomputers are sometimes used to model these things, or at least massive amounts of com computation power. And um, when the, it finally makes it onto a, a journalist's desk to report in the media, perhaps they're going to be less inclined to report it. Why? Well, maybe it says we don't know anything uh, clear about what's going to happen with regard to the climate. Or maybe it says, um, we need better data, or maybe it says, well, this is what we show, but it's only with 70% accuracy. And, you know, everyone knows that 70% is not a very compelling number. It might be for some people that are run, running simulations, but, uh, and 70% sentence is better than 40%, but it's certainly not that, you know, gold standard of 95% or, or something along those lines. So what happens then? Um, and by the way, those are my own observations, not Akerlof's. I, I'm just adding those, those bits about why things may have declined. What she shows though in this descriptive presentation is that when the models are mentioned in the media, it's often within the skeptic discourse, probably because it's easy pickings for them to make an argument against the, uh, the, 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 client, the, the science of climate change. It's not so much a, um, it's not so much an airtight argument, it's one that's filled with holes and that can be picked apart. And this is where, um, this is where actually I think a lot of the, um, uh, the, 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 the counter movements gain a lot of traction by simply saying, we don't know because the scientists aren't uh, convinced and there is no clear consensus. Um, and, and, and that's unfortunate because again, it ignores the nature of science itself that uh, everything is updated, data are improved, uh, and that um, everything is designed to be refuted or challenged. That is science itself. Here's another figure from her study, their study, I should say, where a lot of the mention about climate models is represented by political commentary. The, the most from the right by Rush Limbaugh and on the left by The Nation. National Review and The New Republic, they're conservative as well. That said, what else does the media do? We're gonna to shift to the case where the media can go too far. Weingart et al. in the Weingart et al. 2000 study. By the way, if you are looking for these studies, um, I put the names of them and uh, you could just go to scholar.google.com and look them up. Um, this is Weingart et al. But if you just typed in this title into the search bar, you're going to find it, no problem. It's a very well cited study because what they show is how um, a German news magazine, Der Spiegel, uh, changed the media discourse over the um, 1975 to 85 period where climate change was presented as one where it was uh, skepticism about climate change or that we needed to be more vigilant about climate change. There was phase two, which was a very important phase because this framing, again, framing of the issue and getting it on the policy agenda in Germany, at least, um, the, the framing of a climate catastrophe allowed there to be an advancing of climate changes and how it actually created in lots of momentum in the political discourse. And it, it was used 
catastrophe, the language of catastrophe and catastrophism was used from then on, whether the speakers were politicians, members of, of the government or from the opposition parties. And there were um, many examples of the selective perception and the use of scientific knowledge. Um, yeah, so here is a member of uh, a member of, of parliament saying, you know, I do not intend to paint a horror scenario here, but to address the committed skeptics, I must say the following. There, if there is a climate catastrophe, it will not only be terrible, it will be apocalyptic. This never has happened in other places. Uh, well, I should say in the United States, uh, that kind of language, um, although things have changed. But look at the timeline, 1986 to 1992. This was the, the frame um, from uh, over 30 years ago. And then as a result of that, uh, very, very active media-based movement, there has been this transformation. Subsequent, there was a subsequent transformation of climate catastrophe into an object of routine political regulation. But by that time, already there had been this big focus on uh, installing solar panels, lots of focus on climate change related policies. And even today, Germany is among the highest in terms of responding to climate change in, in some ways. I mean, of course, the Scandinavian countries seem to be the best at have, uh, reducing their carbon footprint. Also in the media are the, um, well, I should say in the media and affecting our politicians views are the influence of climate change counter movements. Uh, I don't have the name of the Brule reading, uh, but I'll be happy to get it to you later on. Uh, Brule 2013, you could just Google climate change counter movements. They, uh, he in, in this study looks at the annual income of these climate change counter movements through um, the collection of IRS data, the Internal Revenue Service. And they, they're looking at advocacy organizations, think tanks and trade associations, and they match that money with IRS philanthropic funding of these climate change counter movement organizations, which is very hard to do because things have become much more opaque, um, uh, at least because of some of these regulations about political support, but at least with regard to tracking the money to these non-campaigning um, non, uh, individuals, um, it, it, it's, uh, it, it, has, it can be identified. Is there a question? No? Okay. Um, there's 10 minutes left. Okay, 10 minutes. Just, yeah. just so you know. And Great. I have a question myself I can ask you at the end. Sure. Okay. Let me, uh, let me uh, go through a few more points. Okay. So um, what they found was that um, there were, from 2003 to 2010, um, a lot of funding coming from different organizations, especially from conservative foundations. And the trend was toward concealing sources through these donor-directed philanthropies. These basically allow these trusts, allow there to be no names attached to the money. So the money goes in and it's uh, unidentifiable. And that's, you know, used on the left, it's used on the right. It doesn't, it's not a a, a, a more conservative approach, but when we look at where the funding is coming for climate change counter movement organizations, donors trust is the single largest source of that money, 78.8, uh, this is in millions of dollars. Um, and, and then a lot of these are also more conservative. Here we see the Koch affiliated foundations, uh, the, uh, yeah. So a lot of, a lot of, clear focus on uh, climate change counter movements by these. Where's it going? That's the source. Where is the target? Uh, the AEI, the American Enterprise Institute, the Heritage Foundation, Hoover Institution, Manhattan Institute, these are all quite conservative uh, all the way around. And a network analysis by Brule also shows the um, size of the node, indicates the, the amount of money and the target indicates the amount of money uh, that is both going out and being received. Um, so actually, the 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 width of the of the edge, the the connection between these nodes, is actually showing the amount of money that's that's going. So a lot of focus on AEI by donors trust. I'm sorry, this isn't uh, clear, but this is the clearest I could get it from their from their image. And then again, donors trust. 
a big player, bigger than any of them from 2006, which is really when a lot of the campaigning uh, had to go into overdrive because of the uh, Obama administration and the big push. Um, all of these are big players in the climate change counter movements, uh, Coke affiliated foundations again appearing here, but donors trust took off. And there are some uh, great um, uh, exposés about this, especially Bill Moyers does something if you wanna learn more. So what can we do? Uh, we've got scientists uh, that can operate as honest brokers. The idea that they're not a pure scientist, they're not an issue advocate. Uh, they are um, uh, also um, not necessarily science arbiters that are adjudicating policy questions. They're using scientific knowledge. And this is Pilkey, by the way, uh, that's the book. Um, they're using scientific knowledge to help clarify and expand the range of options that are available to policymakers. This, however, uh, whether scientists can do this or not depends on whether scientists can consider the degree of the values consensus for a particular issue and whether scientists should consider the degree of uncertainty about a particular policy decision. It's not easy. And this allows there to be some connections to what I referred to earlier with regard to Keller's um, buffering strategy. Um, you know what, I am gonna skip this because of time, but it actually, the, the same science, uh, honest broker challenge came up with regard to how scientists can approach the vaccine for the pandemic. Um, what is the correct approach? How do we, how do min not just vaccines regarding the pandemic, but any vaccine, how do they minimize the risk issue? Do they mention nothing about risks uh, or do they highlight the risks and take the chance that some people are going to oppose the vaccine as a result of that? That's the kind of complex question that scientists are faced with and that they continue to be faced with right now. Um, again, think of AstraZeneca being pulled from the shelves. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, AstraZeneca being pulled from the shelves because of the, the blood clot issue and now making it back onto the shelves uh, in, in certain countries. There are also, of course, challenges in communicating scientific information to the public. People lack the ability to pay attention. People are in politicized environments. Um, there is also problems of attention and source credibility. But as Lupia says in his communicating science and politicized environments, there isn't a need to spin or manipulate or dumb down any sort of scientific presentation. What can be done? Uh, well, source credibility matters a lot. And I, I think some of your other presenters for this summer school have actually been focusing on that, uh, that uh, it, it has a lot to do with who is actually communicating the message. Unfortunately, it's not so much about um, relative expertise, namely that someone has greater expertise than me in real terms than it is the perception of expertise, which means if we're going to actually think about how a lot of the information is communicated these days, that information that comes from uh, maybe misinformation sources, uh, wh wherever they are, if that information is being shared, the, uh, the, the, if I have the perception of source credibility, even though it's a misinformation source, then my, um, my beliefs can be changed. And, and that's an, an unfortunate side effect of uh, Lupia's ability to identify source credibility as being such an important feature. I'm also going to skip this. Uh, I can come back to Kahan. And I want to really uh, point out a, a, a literature review that I did with uh, Toby Bolson and um, um, Anna Fleming, where we look at all of the different findings, all the different frames that are used about climate change. And we also conclude that um, in this new media environment, and I'm wrapping up here, the New York Times has dismantled its environmental desk, uh, that there is the scientific uncertainty frame that's thin the ranks of science journalists. Um, the, the trend of reporting has been increasing about climate change, but um, that probably is because of the growth of the online sector. Uh, where a lot of the information is being targeted and the dissemination of information through new media, social media, and a lot of the scientists that are um, uh, playing a, a role, trying to basically take on that, that, that honest broker role are somehow playing a role in that in, on Twitter or other places. 
That said, we have challenges to that we're facing, namely the difficulty of getting the public to attend to scientific information. We have this gap still in the United States. About, we also have public opinion divided over uh, certain issues on partisan and ideological lines. And we also have media fragmentation of partisan news. What can we do? And this is the final wrap up. Well, as I'm sure many have said in this uh, summer school, we can employ frames that resonate and engage. We can focus on the scientific consensus. We can promote accuracy goals, which is I think the message that you probably got from Sanders van der Linden uh, in terms of not just accuracy goals, but in terms of inoculation, that's also an important feature. And we can also have uh, the focus of scientific organizations on establishing credibility and legitimacy in line with Keller and in line with Pilkey. Those are the strategies that we argued for at least. All right, that's the end. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Shapiro. Oh, yeah. We're done with our time. Uh, that was a very interesting talk. 